when I went to the the conference um, in Lausanne in Geneva, the Martial Arts Studies Conference, which was focusing on martial arts globalization and tradition, uh, one of the papers given was by Luke White, who is a senior lecturer at Middlesex University, and he gave a fantastic paper on the reappraising the Kung Fu comedy film. Um, and also, marvellously and wonderfully, he had pre-recorded it too, so there's an online version available, and he has generously um, sent me a copy that we can use on the podcast. We will see if YouTube allows the use of the images uh, and clips from films. We'll see about that. We might we'll try. Maybe have to contest um, f fair usage and so on. I'm sure the audio version will get through just fine. So in what follows, it's Luke's pre-recorded paper. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. And it's about reappraising the uh, Hong Kong Kung Fu comedy. And I'm sure you will love it. So enjoy. Thank you. Within the study of Hong Kong cinema, the heroic martial arts films of the late 1960s and early 1970s, take for example Bruce Lee's Fist of Fury, have now become classic images of post-colonial discontent and ethno-nationalist rebellion. They're read and embraced as belonging to the tail end of a stormy and militant decade. In contrast, the Hong Kong Kung Fu comedy films that arrived in their wake as the 1970s drew to a close. Films such as Jackie Chan's Snake in the Eagle's Shadow and Drunken Master are often interpreted as a retreat from idealism at a moment a new postmodern capitalist consensus arose and politics disappeared in the colony to be replaced by consumerism. To many, the bratty young heroes, often disconnected from grand social and political causes so frequent in earlier films, seemed cynical and individualistic. For Chan Ting Ching, for example, rejecting traditional values, the films were a reflection of a competitive society in which only the fittest survive and the younger are generally fitter. Lao Tai Muk similarly judges Jackie Chan's performances in them as slick and playful, and expressing and endorsing the virtues of adaptability and using the brain in capitalist societies. However, foregrounding the changing significations of the martial artist's performing body, my argument is that resistance doesn't simply disappear in kung fu comedies, but it changes its mode. The male body, typical of the heroic kung fu era, is sculpted ideal, beautiful, young, and normative. Its origins lie earlier in the 20th century, in China's modernising martial arts reform movements. These in turn belonged to a global discourse of physical culture, which sought, by making the individual bodies of citizens fit, healthy, and martially prepared, to build the strength of the nation and its metaphorical body politic. In China, martial arts took a special place within physical culture movements and were promoted by both nationalists and communists as an indigenous source of strength and identity that eschewed reliance on imported foreign techniques. Kung Fu allowed a riposte to sick man of Asia narratives and to stereotypes of deficient East Asian masculinities that circulated globally under the hegemony of Western attitudes. The Kung Fu comedies reversed much of this, and we find quite a different conception of the body within them. We're faced with a cast of cripples, the elderly, the plump or skinny, the scabrous and the sickly, women and children, often nonetheless with fantastical martial abilities in spite of their deviance from ideal masculinity. Its characters sprout warts and moles, lumps and other protuberances, and the low humour of the films focuses on farts, excrement and food, in the material appetites and excesses of the body, and the places where it exceeds the bounds of its proper form. The recurring character of the drunken master himself typifies this logic, and its departure from the agenda of modernist martial cultures. Rather than his prodigious kung fu emerging from a healthy, hygienic young body, 
His is old, dirty and ugly. He stinks and dresses in rags, rejecting the modern citizen's social obligations toward both the productivity of employment and the reproductivity of family life. The performers of the new genre also presented different, non-ideal physiques, most famously in the case of Sammo Hung, whose acrobatic ability belied the expectations of his rotund frame. Even the more conventionally muscular Jackie Chan departed from the classic good looks of his predecessors, and this is evident in Chan's childhood nickname, Big Nose. In their very acrobatic excess, the Kung Fu comics martial performances are of a piece with these deviant bodies. Rather than presenting the perfected, ideal and the normative, their wild and bizarre movements function according to an aesthetic of the marvellous and freakish. It's hard not to follow Leon Hunt in reading this in terms of the grotesque body of Bactinian Carnival. For Bakhtin, the materiality of the grotesque body serves to resist the static and eternalising forms privileged in high culture's idealising aesthetic of beauty, which he proposes has been fundamental in authoritarian and repressive cultures across history, with their claims to universality and permanence. Instead of an orderly universe, in which things have their unchanging proper place and proportion, the grotesque body celebrates an ontology of life that is constantly flowing and transforming beyond its limits, a matter of becoming rather than being. The sheer heterogeneity of the popular body of Carnival sets it against power's insistence on the totality of its order. To pose this differently, the carnival body of kung fu comedy rejects the disciplined, ordered body of modernising martial arts movements, where flesh is subjected to the idealising demands of social order and mobilised for political ends, offering instead an anarchic and undisciplined alternative. It redefined the popular body of Hong Kong culture, that is to say, in opposition to a unitary mass body identified with the Chinese state and people. Given the nature of either the communist or nationalist versions of this, this disidentification with a particular mode of the political body may not have been a bad thing. The Kung Fu comedy extends the desire, which Petrus Liu discovers more broadly in wuxia fiction, to be what he terms stateless subjects. The Kung Fu comedy also came at a time when Hong Kong identity was increasingly being defined as much through difference from Chineseness as in its terms, and as separate from the political projects of either the mainland or Taiwan. Cantonese language media was growing, and increasing numbers of young people were born in Hong Kong rather than having arrived as immigrants. Hong Kong was increasingly seen as oriented not to homeland and tradition, or the boundaries of a nation, but to both the insistently local and the global flows in which its economy was now integrated. Hong Kong came to name a site suspended between East and West, irreducible to either. The Kung Fu comedy thus became a means to negotiate this condition and redefine Hong Kong identity in its terms. This identity, like Carnival's ontology, involved fluidity and heterogeneity. But since it's marked by a distinct lack of militancy, how should we understand the mode of resistance that Kung Fu Carnival might offer? My argument has been that we can think of it most productively through the notion of hysteria and as a form then of hysterical resistance. Though obsolete as a clinical term, hysteria has also been reclaimed in feminist thought to name a mode of proto-political resistance by 19th century women to a patriarchal discourse that speaks of and for them, but within which they have no voice. Denied ownership of a language inhabited through phallic possession, the hysteric symptoms lodge themselves in the theatricalised body. Hysterical effects, including of course laughter, seize the body and overwhelm the subject as an excess of movement and emotion. <laughs>
Though in many ways the symptoms of hysterics studied by clinicians seemed calculated precisely to conform to their ideas and expectations, it was also through his encounters with such patients that Freud developed the idea of analytical resistance. Their discourse was slippery, and even as it gave in to the authority of the analyst, it evaded and refused it. There is something about this dynamic which is more generally suggestive of the position of what the analysis of pop culture in cultural studies termed the subordinated, those unable to produce culture but only possess and re-signify it through their consumption. Is such consumption always, to some degree, hysterical? Such subordinated subjects might also be seen in more post-colonial parlance as subaltern, and the condition that Victorian women suffered of a denial of a place from which to speak in a language that is not fully theirs, or which they inhabit only as a stranger or an other, might be echoed in particular in the case of peoples under colonial occupation. In terms of Hong Kong cinema, Bhaskar Sarkar has sought to read the overwrought directorial style of 1990s sword plays in terms of a hysteria that responds not just to the anxieties of the looming handover of the colony to Chinese rule, but also a more broadly Asian condition of post-coloniality, capitalist precarity and cultural dislocation. In 1970s Hong Kong, such a condition was exacerbated by the disappearance of politics from discourse as a response to the nightmare of the cultural revolution over the border, by the delegitimating effects of the excesses of the 1967 unrest within the colony, and by the crackdown on dissent that followed from the British authorities. Disappearing from public discourse, one might say, resistance resurfaced in the disordered, hysterical carnival body of the kung fu comedian. Such an interpretation is, in any case, strengthened by the uncanny echoes we find between the clownish antics of the kung fu comedian and 19th century clinicians' recordings of the bodily mobility of hysterical patients undergoing what Jean-Martin Charcot termed fits of clownism and for echoing the plots of kung fu comedies, Charcot interpreted these fits in terms of imaginary combat and strange animal becomings. However, the sense of hysteria as involving a form of resistance that functions within and through obedience leads me to see its apotheosis not in the anarchic brats that Jackie Chan played in the late 70s, but in his move in the 80s to his recurring role as a dutiful cop. This subservient agent of a colonial or global order was quite unlike the anti-authoritarian rebels that Bruce Lee played but his bodily improvisations often end up subverting the order he serves, an order, of course, often already corrupted by wealth, power and colonial or post-colonial injustice. It was in such a role that Chan's work shifted increasingly toward a globalised context, mirroring Hong Kong's own outward orientation. Chan's policemen hysterically negotiate a transnational landscape from a non-Western perspective. It's the film Who Am I which typifies this the best, a film about a Hong Kong-born member of a CIA Special Forces unit who loses his memory and embarks on a search for identity that takes him across Africa and Europe, bringing chaos at each step and untangling a web of global conspiracy. Chan decides ultimately to make his spiritual home not in Asia or the West, but in the African veldt, where earlier he's rescued by kindly tribespeople. On his first awakening as an amnesiac, his rescuers mistake his question Who am I? for his name, turning a question about identity into an identity in itself which is nothing if not a hysterical act, and one which must have had resonance in the context of the 1997 handover of Hong Kong, during which it was being filmed. To finish this paper, however, I want to turn to the significance of all this in the here and now. Kung Fu comedy, I've argued, 
was involved in developing a sense of Hong Kong identity separate from mainland China. Leaving behind the ethno-nationalist militancy of earlier films, the carnival and hysterical qualities of kung fu comedy aided a reorientation toward both the local and the global, fostering heterogeneity and an anarchistic distrust of all authority. However, the cosmopolitan orientation of Hong Kong culture is currently once more under threat. Over the last decade, Xi Jinping's increasingly authoritarian PRC has sought to dismantle the one country, two systems policy that guaranteed Hong Kong a degree of freedom and autonomy. At the same time, the Hong Kong film industry has been increasingly absorbed into the production circuits of the mainland and, of course, subjected to the strict political and moral censorship that makes possible any access to its lucrative market. China's attempts to impose a single national narrative in the SAR led to the growth of localist movements. The Umbrella Revolution occupation of 2014 and the pro-democracy protests of 2019. It was Bruce Lee who became an icon of the moment when his admonition to be water was taken up as a battle philosophy by the protesters. At a time of renewed militancy, it's not surprising that the heady images of rebellion against injustice that Lee once enacted struck a chord once more. In spite of the significance of the Kung Fu comedy within the development of a specifically Hong Kong identity, an embrace of its images and icons has been less forthcoming from protesters. The genre's primary star, Jackie Chan, has since become an establishment figure and a party man, speaking against the protests, so is largely seen as a traitor by those who were involved in them. However, I find myself wondering where the future of resistance may lie in coming years, within both the production of culture and the way it's consumed, appropriated and repurposed by its audiences. The introduction of the national security law, which outlaws dissent against the Communist Party or calls for Hong Kong's independence, makes outright militancy a decidedly risky strategy. Will resistance in these conditions return to something more akin to the hysterical forms of the Kung Fu comedy? And does this retain any value? Certainly one thing we might note is that the low humour of the Kung Fu comedy chimes rather badly with the po-faced, moralistic demands of the Chinese censors. If the Kung Fu comedy does, however, have a palpable, subversive legacy in the present, it's probably through the mediation of the films of Stephen Chow. Chow blended the verbal gymnastics of comedian Michael Huey with an obsession for martial arts imagery and a highly physical, carnivalesque aesthetic borrowed from the golden age of Kung Fu comedy. His play with Hong Kong Cantonese slang and his kaleidoscopic mixture of cultural and filmic references from East and West that only a Hong Konger can fully make head or tail of made him the most profitable star in the local market through much of the 1990s, but meant that he was often thought to be untranslatable beyond this. His work made humour into a means by which Hong Kongers recognised and celebrated their shared experiences and identities, which is also to say that which distinguished them from others. Articulating a specifically Hong Kong sensibility, lines from Chow's films found their way into local slang and common parlance. For example, when in Flirting Scholar, Chow's character pretended a dead cockroach was his pet to elicit pity. The name he gave it, Siu Kung, or Little Power, quickly became a local slang name for the species and even an affectionate metaphor for the resilience of the Hong Kong people themselves. As Hui Ying Ng has argued, Chow's nonsensical Mo Lei Tao humour has been a fundamental source of the more directly satirical and socially critical Er Gao aesthetic that's become important within today's Hong Kong online youth culture. But beyond the local, and in spite of the vagaries of translation, Chow's works have also been taken up in a series of China's internet subcultures since the late 1990s. 
Matthew Ming-Tuck Chu has gone as far as to argue that beyond particular fan cultures, Chow's brand of nonsensical humour has been a key point of reference in the formation of the broad internet culture that, due to its anarchic and participatory nature, and quite pertinently to the subject of my own paper, has been called China's online carnival. In this, memes, GIFs, video clips and catchphrases from Chow form a backbone of references for camp humour, online parody and spoof videos across the realm of social media. In fact, according to Chu, there is no other source, unless one counts the Chinese state and its officials as one, that has generated so many online catchphrases as Stephen Chow. A good example is Hu Ge's Ergao video, The Bloody Case That Started From a Steamed Bun which echoes Chow's absurdist intertextuality in its cannibalization of Chen Kaiger's big budget epic The Promise and leverages this for a range of satirical and socially critical purposes. In Hergu's The Empire of Spring Transportation, a satire on the chaos of China's spring festival travel rush, Chow even appears as the key protagonist within its collaged narrative. Through Chow's intermediation then, the hysterical and carnival ethos of the kung fu comedy's martial, gymnastic and physical performances, opposed as these were to the significations of the kung fu body in the martial arts cinema of the preceding years and the national physical cultures that informed them, continues to find its echoes and effects in the satirical online culture of the present. 